But what we're going to be doing um, is we're going to be thinking about this last section of the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 38. This is a prophecy, as it mentions, in the latter days. And it's talking about a specific time in the history of Israel and involving a certain nation. And we'll, we'll examine that as we go through. So just to, um, which I think is quite helpful, just to have a look at a, uh, an overview of the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39. So in Ezekiel chapter 38 and the first part, um, we heard or we see uh, about the destruction of Gog's armies. And then in the latter part of the first section, um, there is recorded the, uh, the events when Gog invades, invades the land of Israel. And then the, the two sections that we're going to look at in uh, starting at verse 14, God's purpose with Gog, and then um, the presence of the Lord in the earth. And then we see then the, uh, the, the, the later chapter, chapter 39, we've got the burial of Gog's army, the sacrificial feast, and Israel restored. And this is taken, um, this structure is taken from Brother John Olfrey's book on Ezekiel. So I've used that as, our, as a basis for the structure here. And the, here then are the, the two areas that we are going to look at. We're going to split it into the first and the second part of the latter part of Ezekiel 38. So I think uh, one of the reasons why that is suggested is because when you look at these sections, and here is the section, I'm not expecting you to read that, um, and it's not highlighted up there, but it should be where it says in verse 14, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God. And then in verse 17, it starts, thus saith the Lord God. So these two sections start with that phrase, thus saith the Lord God. So verse 14 to 16, talking about uh, God's purpose with Gog and then God's presence that will be in the earth from verse 17 to um, the end of the chapter. So we have then in the first section the, a record uh, of the account of the invasion of Israel by Gog. And so here the explanation is being given to Gog that they are to come at a time when God's people dwell safely. If we have a look at that in verse 14. It says, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in the day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it. So just, uh, just before we, uh, we start, um, the suggestion is, um, and it's quite right, that Gog is speaking about uh, Russia. Okay, um, again, we're not going to go into it at all, but... Um, should be translated the Prince of Rosh, and then when you uh, when you look back into history, uh, you see Rosh being a sim uh, uh, Russia, Meshech and Tubal, Moscow and Tobolsky, and there's evidence for that. That is not our subject at all, so we're we're just going to take that um, as read. So if we if we think about that phrase, then um, when my people of Israel dwell safely. This is what's going to happen when, uh, when Gog will come. Now that word safely is a Hebrew word and it's uh, bitak um, and it meaning to feel secure, okay? Or the idea of to be unconcerned. Let's just have a look at uh, 1 Kings chapter four and we'll see where this is, uh, this is used. And I think this gives the... Uh, this is helpful just to see how this word um, is translated elsewhere. And this is uh, in the reign of Solomon. And 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 25, it just reads, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So we've got that idea then of this idea of a security. So it's at this point um, when this event will take place. Now, if we let's just contrast this with uh, Proverbs, and we see how this word is used. 
But I think uh, to contrast from, or in contrast to uh, what we will see in Ezekiel chapter 38. So we've got this idea of um, Israel feeling safe. Now, one uh, in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 33, we've got, But whoso hearkeneth unto me, so to God, shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Now, here we've got God saying that who listens to him is going to, be, is going to dwell safely and will be quiet from the fear of evil. And I think the contrast is that we've got the same word being used. Um, however, Israel's safety currently during this time when Gog will come, is not because of a trust in God, like uh, God says here in Proverbs, but it's, their, it's the safety in themselves when they're false, falsely uh, believe that they are safe. And so I think that was helpful just to think about the contrast there between that idea of safety and God's idea of safety. And, and so let's just think about... Um, Previously, a, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 28, this is the point in which uh, their position of safety uh, would, be, would have been achieved. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, and starting at verse 24, it's talking about um, unto the house of Israel, nor any grieving thorn of all that are round about them that despise them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, they shall be sanctified to them in the sight of the heathen, the nations, and then they shall dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell safely therein, shall build houses and plant vineyards. They shall, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. So we have again, uh, don't we, that idea of, of the safety and it's at this point, uh, as we've seen in verse 14, that um, Gog will come down. So if we move on to, chapter fi- uh, to verse 15, we get some extra information here. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. So this is the point that... Uh, Gog will come down out of the north parts and very uh, simply just to illustrate that uh, it's quite helpful um, to show that it clearly is um, north and we know don't we that thinking of the army of Russia thinking about the the Gogian army and we don't need it's not our subject we're not going to dwell on it at all but just in the last few months, days, weeks, and certainly over the last few years, we see how that Putin and the Russian army with their allies are building up a huge army. And some people, many of the people in the world would not know what this army is for. However, the Bible tells us explicitly that this is to destroy or come to destroy the the land of Israel. And we see here how that we've got tanks um, settling in Syria and allies uh, being, uh, friendships being built around the, uh, the land of Israel. So we can see here that this is talking about, um, the Rus- uh, talking about Russia and uh, this army. And it says, doesn't it, there will be many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses and a great company and a mighty army. And as we've just said, this is um, clear in the, the world around us that this is, uh, this is certainly happening. And we then read in verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall, shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So this is what the prophecy is, that it's saying that Gog is going to come against my people Israel. So when it's 
when it, let's focus on that set, that um, mention when it says, "I will bring thee against my land." And if let's just turn back to Leviticus chapter twenty six. And God here in Leviticus was explaining the statutes, was ex- explaining the laws that uh, he had made with his people Israel. And despite their unfaithfulness and their failure to follow his commandments, God will remember his people and his land. So let's just have a look in Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 42. It says, Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac. And also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. So despite God, in a way, allowing his land to be, to be desolate, he's never forgotten his land. And it's at this point that God is going to remember his land, and he's going to allow this nation of, uh, of Gog to come down um, to his people. But this is all part of God's plan and of God's purpose. And we, we see, don't we, that the, the verse goes on to say the whole point and the reason, and Brother John mentioned it in his prayer, that the heathen or the nations will know God. And if we were to summarise this, sec- uh, this section, I think, or this uh, last part of, it, uh, of chapter 38, it was that the nations, the people would recognise God. And would come to know him. And we, we see, don't we, that clearly there is, uh, there is a plan that God has. There is a plan and there is a purpose that, God, that the nations will know him. Now, let's think of uh, Gog as Pharaoh. We turn back to Exodus chapter 9. We, are, we know that Pharaoh was used by God. And I think Pharaoh and Gog <coughs> both are used by God, certainly, to, to show to Israel, to teach them a lesson, to show them who is ruling. So Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16. Talking of Pharaoh, and in this very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So as Pharaoh was used to um, punish the nation of Israel, so Gog is going to be used as well. And it's all in God's plan, it's all in God's purpose, that the heathen, the nations will know him. And we know from Daniel chapter 4, that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And I think this shows how God uses uh, political powers of the world to show that he is in control. If we think about uh, some of the current political situations, uh, we think of Donald Trump, uh, the Brexit, the the increase in the right-wing governments. And we think a few years ago, was the world expecting this? Well, I suggest that that wasn't the case. In this current climate, we've got this progressive nature of politics, equality, human rights, And we never would have thought that leaders such as Donald Trump would still be elected. But although it is causing turmoil in the world, and lots of people think that that this is negative, what it tells us as Bible believers is that God is in control, that he decides who is to be in power. He decides what will happen next. And it's it's really important. I think encouraging to think how uh, well blessed we are to know of what is going to happen. We have the um, explanation from God of what is going to happen. We know that God is working and we don't need to fear the, the future as so many in the world do. Yet our focus should only be to ensure that we are ready, that we are prepared for the return of Christ. And here we have this nation, this nation of Russia, who is going to be brought down from the north, and they are going to come with a mighty army, and they are going to come to Israel to show them 
who is in control, to teach the nation of Israel. Now, let's just, um, let's just have a think about what we've, uh, what we've thought about so far. And let's just turn to um, Numbers in chapter 24. Now, I found this quite interesting. I didn't um, look at this until uh, relatively late on. So, uh, but it's quite interesting to see that in Numbers chapter 24, we have um, Balaam. And Balaam is, is talking about, um, and this is in verse 20, it says, And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. So here we've got the, uh, the nation of Amalek. And here described in verse 20, they were the first nation who came up against Israel. And they were the first to fight against God's people. Now, in that verse, in verse 20, it says that they shall perish forever. Now, turn to Exodus chapter 17, and we read of this event of the nation of Israel being victorious over Amalek. And Exodus chapter 20, uh, sorry, 17 and verse 14, it explains here that to, to celebrate this victory, verse 14, and the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi or Yahweh Nissi. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So here we've got this first nation, Amalek, who were fighting, uh, who were the first to fight Israel, and as a, as a um, to show that they had uh, fought them, or they had uh, beaten them, they were to create this altar called Yahweh Nissi, which means Yahweh my ensign. So this was uh, uh, to be an ensign to show what had happened. And it goes on to say, doesn't it, that there would be a war from generation to generation. But there was the message that God had said that they would perish. So we don't need to turn uh, to Numbers chapter 21, but if we think about this idea of an ensign, and we, talk, we think about uh, in Numbers when, um, in fact, I'll just read it to you. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a, ser uh, a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, here we have that Hebrew word for on the pole, which means an ensign. It's that, it's that word, uh, ness, meaning an ensign. And when we go to the Gospel of John... And chapter 3, we read that this was talking of a future event as well. In John chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. <clears throat> and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we're linking this event then in Numbers to uh, Christ. And we have this, this uh, pole, meaning this ensign. So here we have Christ, who is this ensign, this sign, that those who will look upon him will have eternal life, speaking specifically to the Gentiles. So hear me out. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. <clears throat> And this is talking about <clears throat> Christ. And verse 10 says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So hold that thought, and then let's finally just turn to 
Romans in chapter 15. <clears throat> and this is, uh, again, this idea is picked up from Isaiah chapter 11. And it says, And again Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. And this is speaking about Christ. So my point is that I think this shows to us that this army in the, in the future, this Gogian army, are to be a manifestation of that first army, the Amalekites, who fought against God's people. And as this altar was set up as an ensign, and as Christ was an ensign, as mentioned in John chapter 3, this, the only way that God's people are going to be able to be saved when this latter day um, army of the Amalekites, this manifestation of the Amalekites, is to when they look to Christ. Um, and when they look to Christ, they will be able to be saved. So I think that's quite, um, quite an interesting way that you can see that first, um, that first army who fought against um, Israel was actually a manifestation of the last army that what is going to fight against uh, God's people. Now, what did it say in Numbers? It said that they would, be, they would perish forever. And I believe that um, in Ezekiel 38, when we, when we look at that, we talk about the destruction of this army. And we know, don't we, that at that point, that army, that resistance against uh, God's people will perish forever. And just in... Numbers chapter 24, I'll just read it to you, which is quite interesting. It says, um, to, again, Balaam, he shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, okay, the Amalekites, and his kingdom shall be exalted. So I think in that verse, again, we've got illusions from this pattern that we've seen to Christ, who is going to be higher than Agag, and his kingdom will be exalted. So this theme of uh, the nations who are against Israel, who first attacked them, will finally be destroyed. So hopefully you've seen that, um, you've seen that there's those clear links between that, and I think that's quite uh, interesting to see uh, and to compare the first and the last. So back in Ezekiel and chapter 38, and let's have a look at the next section then. So we've looked at um, the first part, and now let's look at this, this last section, which talks about God's presence um, being in the land. And we read, so verse 17, Thus says the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them, and that point, should have said this earlier, that is the verse which uh, tells us that this has already been spoken about, which is then, uh, which takes us back to um, the Amalekites. So, verse 18 then, And it shall come to pass, at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. <clears throat> so when Go comes against Israel, this army who God, uh, God is using to show to Israel who is their God, there will be a reaction from God. It says that my fury shall come up in my face. And prophecy of Zechariah talks about God and it says in Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 for thus says the Lord of hosts after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you for he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye for behold I'll shake mine hand upon them and they shall be a spoil to their servants and they shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me so here we've got this idea that those who are going to oppose Israel 
those who touch the apple of God's eye will be dealt with. And this is that response from verse 19 to verse 23 of our chapter. This is the God's response to this nation who he raised up for he, to uh, show to Israel him. This is God's response. And God is using a Gog as a tool to punish and to turn his people back to him. So... We read then in verse 20, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountain shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. So here... I think we might have an an allusion back to an earlier time in history. If we just think about uh, the time of Noah, and we think about the covenant that God gave to Noah, and we have this same list here that is given to Noah. And if we think about these this uh, idea of the fish of the sea, of the fowls of the heaven, the beasts of the field, and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. If we think about Noah and this time, what was the aim of the flood? Well, clearly the aim of the flood was to rid the world of wickedness and to show that God was in control. And we ask the same question here, what is, the, what is God's aim? when there will be this great shaking, this great earthquake. And clearly it is designed to show, uh, to destroy the wickedness that is in the world and to show everyone all of these things, to show everything that, uh, to show God's presence, to show that God rules in the kingdom of men. And as Noah was uh, one of only a few saved, that will be uh, the same in this future time. And of course, this is the purpose, isn't it? And it's mentioned again and again. Um, And in verse 23, the whole purpose of this earthquake is, as it says right at the end of the chapter, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So let's think about this um, presence then. Think about God's presence. And previously, we've got God's presence being revealed in angels that God chose to, uh, to put his name in. If we turn back to Exodus chapter 23, just going to um, have a look at a couple of verses just to show this, and to show how this is going to change. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 21. So, for mine angel shall go before thee, and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. So here we've got God's angel is going to go, and he was going to um, do God's will here against these nations. Now to Isaiah chapter 63, to show uh, another example of this. And this is... uh, This is more clear to see. Here we have, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. Okay, so here we've got God's name being in within the angels. Okay, and however, this is going to change. This is not going to be how God is going to work. So God's name is no longer going to be within the angels explicitly. But let's turn to Matthew chapter 23 and think about what is the change that is going to be. That instead of God's name being in the angels, it is talking specifically about... I don't think that's the right verse... 
don't think that's the right verse, but it's uh, speaking about... 39. Is it 39? No, I don't think so. Matthew 23... I think I'm in the right. But here it's talking about in the latter days that Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, will actually bear the name of the Lord. So instead of the angels working uh, for God and bearing his name, bearing his presence, in the future time it's going to be uh, the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to um, to bear the name of the Lord here. So we've got we've got this idea then. Um, back in Ezekiel and chapter 38, we've got this idea then that um, as a result of this army, Gog, God is going to pronounce his fury. And we've got the all of these nations are going to shake. And we think about uh, this shaking in a second. There's going to be this earthquake and they are going to recognize and are going to know who is in control, that God rules in the kingdom of men. So let's just think, uh, think some more about this uh, presence. And here we've got prophecies of the Lord coming. And this is uh, building on what I've just said about, even though I couldn't find it in, uh, in Matthew, building about what I've just said about the Lord coming, about where it says about the Lord coming, but it's speaking specifically about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just have a look at these to show that uh, Christ's return is, uh, will be bearing the name of God. So Zechariah chapter 14. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So here we've got talking about the Lord Jesus Christ being manifested here And it's talking about God. Then shall God go forth and fight against those nations with Christ bearing his name. Also in Isaiah and chapter 66 and verse 15, we read, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Once more, the Lord is mentioned, but it's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, in Joel and chapter 3, future prophecies. Joel chapter 3 and verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So building on that point, we have... God who is being shown in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to perform God's will. So whereas we had the angels bearing the name of God and uh, showing his presence, that is now the job of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God. And we read, didn't we, of this great shaking this earthquake that is going to take place. Here we have the, uh, the parallel records of this event. We've got Ezekiel uh, chapter 38, Habakkuk 3, Joel 3, and Zechariah chapter 14. And just look on the screen, you'll be able to see. And, and this is merely just to show that there's no doubt that these uh, are talking about the same thing, that this is, uh, this is a literal event that is going to take place. And all of these uh, parallel records show that. So we've got the great shaking in the land in Ezekiel chapter 38. In Habakkuk chapter 3, it talks that uh, there is going to be this shaking of the earth. In Joel 3, the same. And in Zechariah chapter 14, it adds more detail. It says that the Mount of Olives are going to cleave. And this presence that is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 is again mentioned, but in, in a different form. We've got God coming from Teman and, we, uh, and the chariot specifically in Habakkuk chapter 3. We've got jo- in Joel chapter 3, we've got Yahweh, the Lord shall roar, and mighty ones are going to come down. And then again in Zechariah chapter 14, let's just turn to Zechariah chapter 14. And we can see this 
see both of these uh, speaking about this time, and as I said, added, adding extra detail. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4, and his feet... So, verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. So, here we have this, uh, this great shaking, uh, this great earthquake. Now, this shaking is a political shaking, but also a physical shaking. It's going to be an earthquake that is going to rock the world. We know, uh, we're not going to look into it at all, but we know that there is a, a fault line um, in that area, which further suggests that God uses these natural causes to fulfill his work. Just like the flood. It's natural, but it is on a huge scale. Now, just because there is, a, there is a fault line and it's been found, it doesn't mean that that means we need to always look for these natural explanations to God's, uh, to God's word. Because we know, yes, God do, does use um, nature to fulfill his purpose. But we also know that God can do whatever he pleases and however he and uh, do it however he would like to and he uses the natural causes to show his power and his glory and we've seen that haven't we in those uh, parallel records that this earthquake is going to come and it is going to shake the land so the presence of Yahweh in Ezekiel 38, the chariots of salvation in Habakkuk, Yahweh's mighty ones and Yahweh's feet are all referring to the Lord Jesus Christ and his emergence into the political world. Christ has returned to the earth before this time to judge the world, to prepare the saints. And this work, this political work, is the work that Christ and his saints will do. And as it is recorded in Psalm 149 to execute to them the judgments written towards Gog and towards those, uh, the armies. So this nature of this battle between Gog and this battle uh, between Gog and Christ and the power that the Gogian armies will face will cause them to turn against each other. And it mentions that, doesn't it, in chapter 21. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. So as we've seen, Zechariah chapter 14 um, explains that the armies of Gog will face, uh, face the power of God. So just... Look at the end of, of verse 20, and we think about, well, what's the result of this, um, this earthquake? We have that the mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. So in the margin for the steep places, we have um, the towers. Okay, so this is suggesting or seemingly to suggest that this earthquake is going to be so powerful that these towers uh, suggested the holy buildings, the religious landmarks, are going to fall and to be destroyed. That politically and physically, God is going to show his power. And if you think about in the days of old, when we had the nation of Israel who were um, sinning before God and had turned away from God, like in the days of old, kings who came into power and immediately cleansed the nations of its groves and its idols. That is exactly what Christ will do when he destroys the army of Gog and the earthquake will bring these buildings to the ground. And this will certainly be the, uh, the case in terms of the, the religious world, the world's religions, that they'll be overthrown as Christ emerges as king. And it goes on to say in verse 22, And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, 
and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone, talking about this event. Thus will I magnify him myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And just uh, the, the English Standard Version reads in uh, that final verse, So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So at this point, we can see the, the journey that we've been on. We can see how God is using uh, Gog as to show his power. And God is going to be manifest through his son. And his son will show to the nations around God's greatness and his holiness. The nations are going to be fixed on Jerusalem and Israel. And they will have seen this great outpouring of God's power. And we, we ponder and we think about what is, going to, what is going to happen next at this point. These nations all around that have seen this great army destroyed, this army destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read in Psalm 110, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So this is what's going to, going to happen. And Ezekiel 39 is going to talk about in more detail how uh, the armies of Gog will be destroyed. And all of this is to show God's power. And back in Psalm 102, we think about more, uh, more about uh, this time that in verse 15 likens to this time. So the, na- the nations, the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. So we've got this time period then that uh, Christ is going to be ruling and the nations are going to come to an understanding of the power of God. Uh, And they are going to be they're going to see that through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. So we've gone through that quite quickly um, and hopefully you can see how um, God is working through Gog that um, they are going to come to perform God's will. But because of that, like Pharaoh, God is going to deal with them and going to ultimately show his glory. And so we think about us and we have, unlike the nations around, accepted Christ. We know the plan. We know the purpose of God. We can see the movements of this Gogian army, Russia. We can see the nations aligning themselves together. And all of this fits in with Bible prophecy. And this must therefore exhort us and encourage us to maintain our vision towards the kingdom. So that when Christ does return, we may be able to play a part in this work. To destroy this army that opposes God, that opposes his people. And ultimately to show forth God's glory.